something is wrong. You better get to the hospital and figure out what's going on, okay? So that's the thing that we cannot now do, it will be done in the future. Accident alerts and scarcity of resources. There are half a dozen, ten things every human being needs. We need food, we need water, we need energy, we need shelter, we need health care, we need, you know, uh, so there, all of them, there are scarcities. There's water scarcity. In Chennai, we, are, we know that, right? There's been water shortage for many years, and they were trying to build this desalinization plant for 10 years. They're still building it. And, uh, you know, so anyway, the problems are there, and I, as an individual, should be notified my water is going to be turned off. Therefore, I should get a bucket of water and put it in the house so that I can at least have some basic facilities. So everything, the scarcity is a way of life in society and I need intelligent agents that know it. They are all knowing, all, uh, this is what I mean by omniscient. And th those are God-like qualities. But they're not godlike, they're simply technology. Think of it. <laughs> and so again, the same thing, always on, always working, always learning. So the economic impact of these, if we had these things, if you imagine every one of us is ten times more productive, we can do ten times the jobs that we can now do, amazing things will happen. Even if only, you know, the, you know, basically our global GDP is a hundred trillion dollars. Even if we improved by 10 percent, that's a, a creation of additional wealth of 10 trillion dollars, not billion, 10 trillion dollars globally. And that's what will come out of these agents. So we are going to be a world of plenty, Garden of Eden, in the middle of everywhere. And the question is, will it be used for good or bad? Will somebody corner the market? There's a whole same set of issues that come up around it, which we haven't yet solved. But the important thing is, technology is going to make certain things possible. How we use it, how we control it, how do we make it, is something we need to discuss. So now we need, we need to go one step further, saying, can we predict the future? You know, what is going to happen to the world and AI and so on. But surprisingly, I'm very cynical about <laughs> predicting the future. Essentially, I used to be at Stanford in the 60s, right? Here is the list of projects we used to do in the 1960s, before we had a billion times more computing power million times after 1980. If I go back to 60, it's a billion times more computing power. We used to do all the things. It's the same thing. We are now still doing the same thing. If we come back 50 years from now, we'll be doing the same thing because none of them have been solved perfectly. It's like, not like saying, I've solved the multiplication problem. It's not a problem anymore. Even that is not true. Somebody invented a different system, it's not, not bi bi decimal system, it's a binary system. Now you have to invent binary multiplication. It's the same algorithm. So, so my, my pro proposal is there are certain things will continue to be the same. Everything that we will see 50 years from now, we are already doing today, not do. But there will be some things that we will be able to take some un resolved AI problems, a system that do all those things together, learn from experience, use a lot of knowledge, communicate, tolerate error and ambiguity. We don't have a system that do that now, but then we can build them. And same is true with imprecise tasks. There are tasks, you know, where uh, we may need creativity or innovation or empathy and consciousness. Those are, are all imprecise terms. We don't know what it means to be consciousness. We don't know what it means to be creative. Or we do, 
but they are not precise, but we believe all those things we can begin to solve. And there are a lot of other kinds of learning. There's a big bandwagon on deep learning these days because it's a very powerful tool. It turns out you learn from examples, learn from learning by doing. Uh, just if, all you have to do is look over my shoulder when I'm doing something and do it. You don't need a million examples of it. That's what deep learning needs a million examples for everything. And learn from teachers. So the question you can ask is, can I put a computer in a classroom along with children and let the computer learn exactly like the children? Because it knows how to recognize speech. It has to do the same homework at the end of the day, if it understood it, so we know. We can define the problem, but we <laughs> I don't know how to solve it yet, right? So those are the kinds of things. Um, many times I, I tell your name, like Brzezinski. You may only hear it once, but you, next time I say it, you'll recognize it. Current machine learning systems require millions of examples of Brzezinski before they will recognize it. That's not good. You need systems that learn with far So there are a lot of unsolved problems we can define, and they're going to be around, whether it's 10 years or 50 years, doesn't matter. So, I'm sorry. In conclusion, many AI tasks we are working on were started six decades ago. What progress has been slow and problematic. Even deep learning was started 35 years ago. And uh, we, going forward, we'll continue to make incremental progress. We know what has to be done, how we can, we're going to do it, and so on. The main difference is now we have million to billion times more computing power. As McCarthy said, we, to get to true AI, to get to true AI, we will need 1.7 Einsteins, 3 Maxwells, and a 7.7 .7 Manhattan Project. We don't yet have the Einstein or Maxwells of AI, and we don't have the money that went into Manhattan Project. When all of that happens, maybe we'll have the equivalent of a you know, human-level intelligence. Thank you. There is no danger of AI taking over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for the insightful speech, sir. Uh, the floor is now open for a Q&A session for Professor Levy. I'm told if there are any questions I could I could answer, I could answer. Please, yes, go ahead. Do you, you have a question? Uh, sir, uh, you know, we design everything for human's benefit. That's how the nuclear bomb, before the nuclear bomb, all the things started. The use has turned into a different angle. And we know that there is security problem whereby lot of terrorism happens whereby we just blow the pipeline and everything is used we have now you know advanced persistent threat kind of thing whereby we try to manipulate even at the state level so when we have this kind of thing and the security is there everyone will manipulate that agent and what will happen to that agent will not turn out to be benefit but quite the reverse effect what is your thought on that so this has been a problem, privacy and fake news and hacking and lots of things. And I have no better solution than any of you. And uh, what we've been living with is there was an experiment that was done where they said, you can stop using Google, which captures everything you say and remembers it. Everything you've ever done or said using Google remembers it, it has the data. It can use it for anything it wants because you signed off at the beginning. They, there was an experiment where this person <coughs> chose not to use Google for six months or a year 
and survived. They wrote, she wrote a book about it. But unfortunately, it was so painful on everything that they had, she had to do, finally she gave up. It's called, the book was called Dragnet Nation, I think it was called. But, so you, it turns out the same technology that makes our life easier, simpler to do, also comes with some warts. It's no different than what happens in human systems. Every time I eat too much, I, become, I also have diabetes. There are all kinds of cause and effect. There are things and uh, that we have viruses in human systems. And so I don't know what will happen, how it's going to be controlled. But my hope is, I'm an optimist by nature, otherwise I wouldn't be working on AI. <laughs> and uh, as an optimist, I'm hoping society will, ha it has a sur survival instinct, human beings have survival instinct. We will do the right thing. How we will do it, I don't know, but uh, I don't have any better answer than you would have. Thank you. Uh, sir. Uh, Excuse me. I'm here. Sir, uh, to your right. Here. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, so my question is with respect to the guardian angels uh, phenomena that you have talked about. Uh, do you also think on a parallel basis the concept of strategy would die with respect to guardian angels? So there will be nothing called strategy as such in the world if in case God in Asian sex is right. So, so do you think that will happen eventually? Basically I see, I don't know if you've read there's a book by Marvin Minsky called Society of, you know, Society of Intelligences or Society of Agents or something. You know, where he imagines there's no one intelligence, there are lots of them. Uh, so Society of Minds is the name of the book. So the issue here is, when I see, think of a guardian angel highly specialized, it has only one task, and that task it does very well. It can't do anything else. And so the question is, it has to be imbued with all the knowledge about that one task. I might have an earthquake guardian angel, I might have a tsunami guardian angel, I may have, you know, travel, aeroplane, guardian angel, whatever it is. And even that take will take a lot of knowledge. So ultimately, I think, um, so it looks like we are overstaying, everybody is kind of getting restless. Why don't we stop at this point and um, we can, and if you have any questions, come on over and we'll talk. Thank you. I now call upon Dr. Chitra Babu, HOD of the CAC Department and Vice Chair, ACM Chennai Campus, to deliver the vote of thanks. Distinguished guest of the day, Professor Raj Reddy, Madam Kalav Jaitmar, President of SSN Institutions, Principal Dr. Salivahanan, faculty, students, fellow ACM members, special invitees, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this special occasion. On behalf of both SSN College of Engineering as well as the entire ACM Chennai chapter fraternity, I would like to express the deepest gratitude to Professor Raj Reddy for having accepted our request to deliver this exclusive address. As a, a, to mark the 50 years of uh, the ACM's uh, prestigious Alan Matheson Turing Award, ACM Chennai chapter has been organizing a series of talks on contributions of the Turing Award winners from last year, March. Today's expert talk by Professor Raj Reddy, a Turing Award winner himself, for his pioneering contributions in continuous speech recognition, it's really something, a day which, will, which we will be cherished for our lifetime. Thank you very much, sir, for taking time. from your busy schedule to be with us today, the way in which 
you took us through the fascinating history of AI during the past five decades and shared your vision for the future was fantastic. The excitement in this auditorium was really that is there is air, this air itself has excitement and it, all, it is indeed palpable. And uh, I'm sure the students present here have a lot to take away from your inspiring, optimistic and forward-looking talk. Thank you again, sir, sir, for making this day very, very special for all of us. I also would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to Kalaman and Principal Sir for their unstinted support. My sincere thanks also goes to Mr. Ganesh Prasad and his team for the perfect logistic support extended. Finally, I would like to thank Professor Venkatesh Raman of Institute of Mathematical Sciences, who is the current ACM India Vice President for his gracious presence. Thanks fellow ACM members, esteemed invitees from industry and academia, faculty and students for being a great audience and for your enthusiastic interaction. Thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you. And uh, finally, on behalf of uh, ACM India Chennai Professional Chapter, I would like to hand over a small momento to Professor Raj Reddy. Thank you for our event for today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, dignitaries from other institutions are requested to remain seated in the auditorium. Thank you.
the answer is no, absolutely not. When they lose jobs, it will happen very gradually. That is because basically what happens is, if I do something that makes my job much more productive, I don't need as many people to do the same job. For example, in agriculture, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 95% of the population was in agriculture. Then we introduced automation, mechanization, and so on in agriculture. Now it's only 5% of the population of the world produce all the food needed for the world. Same thing, but what will happen is, if there are essential jobs that are now being done by a significantly large population, 10 or 20 percent, in the future we may only need half as many or one-third as many, and the other people will find other jobs. However, what the government has to do is wherever there is disruption, they have to provide unemployment insurance schemes and that unemployment insurance must be long-term. You know, especially if I'm 60 or 65, you can't say I'm going to teach you some other subject to go to work somewhere else. Say, I don't want to learn anything else, I'm too old. Uh, just uh, give me... You know,